All right, hello everyone. Nate Zeisler here. I'm the Dean for Community Initiatives at the Colburn School, and I'm joined today by Liab Sofer, who's been with us at Colburn for several years now, uh, doing a number of things at the institution. Uh, first, most importantly, Liab is uh, our connection to a number of community programs that we have through, through Colburn. And I, I'd also, we're gonna get into another program that he has called the Urban Voices Project, which I think will be very inter interesting to many of you who are uh, watching today. But to start, Leo, can you just give us a little background about yourself? Uh, talk to me about your, uh, start, when you started with music to the, to the point of where you are now in your career. Yeah, um, you know, Apple didn't fall far from the tree, my mother's a cantorial uh, cantor which is if you don't know what that is it's like a minister of music for the jewish culture and religion and so um grew up with music playing piano and singing uh you know a lot of jazz i did the jazz band and that was like guiding me through high school and middle school was my jazz band director pete perez my uh choir director megan arthurton influenced me to do a lot more singing and she convinced me along with my mom to not only audition I was doing clarinet too, so I auditioned for college on clarinet and voice and uh, did around LA and it was Cal State Long Beach that not only gave me scholarship but said, you know what, you can do both here and that was really appealing. So I did my both performance degree in clarinet and in classical voice, um, double degree and then finished Cal State Long Beach and found a job right out of college so luckily with you. Dr. Nate Zeisler, because he believed in me uh, for an after school uh, high school program for underserved high school kids. And we, I just started at Colburn for this one little class, two hours a week. Uh, a couple years after my work was growing there with you at Colburn, um, it was you and a board member, Bob Atia, who asked the question, how Bun Colburn is here at Bunker Hill, you know, six blocks away from Skid Row, the highest level of elitism right next to the lowest level of poverty in Los Angeles and how can Colburn do something and we experimented with a program that was uh, combining Colburn and our initiatives and work and resources with Wesley a uh, health clinic serving Skid Row with Christopher Mack my co-founder of the Urban Voices Project and two years ago we became a 501c3 We've expanded our programs all over Skid Row multiple days a week. We have programs all over the county now in Venice and South LA. And all is focused on using music and community singing for wellness and for self-expression, but we also connect and bridge people to services. Um, so we work very closely with community clinics and social services in LA. Yeah, you're such a great leader of that organization and it's so great to have you at the, the helm. I, I'm curious about you know, you, you could have taken this in any direction, right? It could have gone to drumming or to guitar or dance, but you have stuck with choir, uh, Urban Voices Project. Why is choir such a, a powerful tool for this work that you're doing? Oh, so many reasons. I mean, everyone, if you, they, everyone's heard this. If you can talk, you can sing. Um, and we always say that, you know, whether you're a professional singer or a professional shower singer, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's, music is, music and singing to me, it's above all of us. It channels through us and it's an entity that philosophically um, feels bigger than all of us. But even vibrationally, it's, it's something that really does just channel through us. But politically, you put an individual from Skid Row and you grab an individual from Beverly Hills you put them in the same room and you ask them to sing the same note together, what are you gonna get? So music as a concept and as an art form, it doesn't see color, it doesn't see gender, it doesn't see class and race. And it, instead, it kind of puts all of that and leaves it at the door and it puts it aside. And it truly in singing, and there's like all these scientific articles I can send you about how it even lowers your heart rate because of the vibration and it massages your body from the inside. But, but the way that singing lines people up together is, is a whole nother layer. I mean, another small snippet. Did you know that if people sing in the same room, their heartbeats start to line up because they're taking breaths in the same synchronized way. You cannot, in my brain, you cannot be more connected to a room of people than when you're all singing at yeah. the same time, listening, 
while being actively participating. Uh, I'm curious, can you give us a sense or a glimpse of what a typical rehearsal might look like? What is it, can you walk us through what is the space and what does it mean to be giving uh, choral instruction for residents of Skid Row? It's really great because, you know, at first I, I came from, you know, whenever you're working in a, in a, in a, how do I start this? Whenever you're working in a circumstance where you're working with people that have a lot of challenges, you also learn about your own privilege a lot if you come from privilege. And you realize these assumptions people make, you know, that, oh, Skid Row is full of people that need us to bring them a gift of, the gift of music. And what I quickly learned is there is music in Skid Row. There is music in the people that are going through challenges. There is incredible artistry. They are incredibly talented artists. And, and I had to quickly learn that I'm not going down to Skid Row and gifting anything. I'm just going there to activate community and to collaborate with, active, with artists that are already there. Yeah. And that was something I already had to learn that you know, there's all these different kinds of people walking through the door and people would walk through the door that even if they're going through challenging times, they had a health crisis. One person had cancer and then his house burnt down and he was left with nothing. But he was trained as a music educator with a degree in music and an incredible performing uh, resume. And then I've had people who are at the other side of the spectrum. They, they, they literally doubt that they have any artistry. I mean, I don't know if you out there in the music education world know that there's this whole stigma that's purely cultural where people say, oh, I can't, I don't know how to sing. And then me as a vocal educator, I always say that's just not true. Everyone can sing. There's no such thing as, there's not even such thing as tone deaf. It's just a muscle you haven't been working. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, as well as trying to change the cultural idea that, oh, I can't sing, we've been bringing people in to, to remind them that singing is not about excellence. It's about participation in community. It's about finding wellness in yourself and that voice you thought you didn't have and expressing yourself in a new way. So we have beginners, like complete amateurs who come in and their vocal range is like three or four notes, but then they sing in choir for like two years in a choir that doesn't reject anyone. There's no audition. You're always welcome. Yeah. And I have members that now have grown a range to two octaves because and, and they've told me they're like Leah I've been kicked out of all the choirs I ever tried to sing in they kept telling me I don't know how to sing I can't sing and this is the first choir that doesn't kick you out they just you could be singing the wrong pitch and they keep just working with you and working with you yeah and uh, so it's been a very diverse range of talent that we get to collaborate with and we get to activate with yeah. so it's not what people think where it's all I have a lot of people there who teach me a lot. You know, we have different offerings at Urban Voices to give your listeners a little perspective. There is, it started with a choir, but then there's more needs we wanted to answer. So there's education programs. There's actually very wellness and therapeutic focused programs as well. And um, then finally, we, we kind of combined all, all of the work we did into this one program called Neighborhood Sing, which combines wellness, combines education, it's focused on, it's not just a sing-along, but it's a guided sing-along with guided discussion, pedagogy in culturally literate and trauma-informed care and social and emotional learning, which are buzzwords in the, the world of really trying to get to the core of what music can do for people. That, you know, it's not about getting to the excellence in music, but about seeing what musical music can do, or as music therapists say, using music for non-musical results. And, um, and in this case, we can say using singing for non-singing, you know, singing based results. And that class has become the thing that's transformed our programs and people can walk in its entry level. And then the final program, just to give you the final connections um, of everything we're doing, there, there's one that's a, we do a mommy and me class in the family shelters that my co-director Kate Richards Geller runs. And the final program that people might know us for is the performance choir, the one that we started because now it's become everybody goes into these other programs and funnels if they want more commitment and they're ready for it because they have a lot of other their services met such as food and shelter then they start committing to a performance choir which we we are actually very quite we treat ourselves very professionally and even though we're a non-audition we do ask for a commitment and um we go to professional level stages we've sung at the dorothy chandler we've sung on at a grand performances and other big stages to try to continue the advocacy work of what's going on as, as the choir's the face, the programs at Skid Row are the heart of what we do. And that gives you kind of like a quick 
shot of what, everything that's going on. Well, I thank you. And I certainly uh, applaud you and the team for your amazing work in growing this organization. You know, one more question I have around Urban Voices Project is a question for those who are listening. Um, I'm curious for, any, you know, many people may be thinking, oh, this is, you know, this connection to between your art and social justice issues is something that may be uh, of interest to, to them to pursue. What advice do you have to people who might be considering uh, walking down a path that you've, you've walked down? Um, you have to show up. You just have to show up. And you have to start showing up even though you have no idea what you're doing. Um, you are constantly also fighting the fight that arts matters. I think all of us artists feel that, that fight, but you know, people ask me, isn't food and shelter the most important? Why should I, you know, either support or donate or care about someone who's trying to make singing happen? Yeah. Um, and I think that for those that are artists in the social justice world to discover the value of the art for yourself and know how to advocate for it is, is really tricky, but also so important. And we've been trying to constantly push on the, push the envelopes for people to understand, and that's not the right term, but push for people to understand that arts is part of a holistic comprehensive system to serving people that are vulnerable. But when you can step into a space and you hear singing, when you step into an office and in the other side of the hallway is art, and it opens the door and it says, come in. And not only for you to sing with us, but let's hear your voice. What do you have to say? What do you have to sing? Yeah. It can change the way a person values themselves first. It can change the way we all see them and we take away the number that's tattooed on their foreheads. And instead we hear Iron sharing his incredible poetry or Marilyn belting out like the incredible mezzo she is. And that's when we discover humanity. And I think that people are get service resistant, as they say, where they don't, they don't trust the system and they feel scarred by the system. And arts has actually been the thing that pull people in. I have people that schedule their health appointments with their doctors around choir rehearsal at the clinic. Or I have people that will schedule their appointments with their social worker around the neighborhood sing at their local shelter or, or service provider because the arts is what makes them feel like they're human. Yeah. And all of these other systems that are still catching up are now able to access these people and they're feeling like they're treated like is equals. Yeah. So you, you have to, I, that was a long spiel, but to say, if you learn how to, to advocate for the arts and its place as a canvas and as a true th tr important thread to this system, just like as you can share in that little anecdote, yeah. then, when you discover that, you're going to discover a clearer way and a clearer path of what you need to fight for in your community or for the vulnerable populations that you're interested in supporting. That's, that's great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, so I want to turn the subject just a little bit to the, uh, to the virtual choir six that Eric, uh, that Eric is putting out. Uh, you have a history. There's a little history here with the virtual choirs. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, I don't know if Eric would remember me. I had short hair at that time, but um, the it was back in 2000, gosh, was it 2013 or 12 or 11, one of those years. And uh, when Eric was on the TED Talk stage in Long Beach, he was attempting, I think it was the first time he ever did it live and maybe globally where they he had a partnership with Skype to do a virtual choir of 100 voices in a in a um, projection back here while there was a live choir of 80 voices or so in the front and i was in the live choir on the ted stage we were singing um cloudburst i think was the piece okay. uh, that eric wrote which is perfect for the fact that there was still a 1.1 second lag with just as there is today even as there was 10 years ago yeah. and so like it's just cues that allow people to eventually trickle into the next vocal expression or, or body percussion expression of a storm, simulating a storm, which was gorgeous. And, uh, you know, we, we still had a lag back then, so we still couldn't solve the whole problem of how to do this live. Yeah. Um, but it was the next closest thing. And that was really cool to be there 10 years ago and here a decade later, 
uh, virtual choirs is the buzzword is is the thing to happen mid COVID pandemic. <laughs> and we're you know we're really excited to to be a part of this uh, this endeavor uh, at Colburn. I'm just curious about your impressions of of the virtual choir uh, as a as a function of choral music. Not completely diminish that question in any way or or what I you know I, I like to change the thought slightly to just being as a choir director. Yeah how much harder it is to be in something like intentionally mm -hmm. when you're by yourself and when you're feeling isolated. Um, and if you want to be sitting there and recording something that you can truly feel is powerful and believable and authentic, even if you're just singing alto two among six parts, you know, or eight parts in SSA, ATTBB, and you're like, you know, having trouble feeling it. Um, Maybe what I just shared in this last 20 minutes can help you feel more connected to the meaning and the value of what you're doing. Yeah. Maybe taking a moment to think about how lucky and blessed we are, the fact that we can do this will give a, a little extra layer of meaning and value to, the, to that little alto two part that you're singing or tenor one or whatever. Um, and I'm not sure yet. I haven't heard about which piece that's going to be the one that uh, Eric's having everyone record. Did, did, do a, you know which piece it is? A, it's a premiere. It's a brand new piece. Say it again. It's a, oh, it's a premiere. premiere. Yeah. So I, 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 I have not seen the contents of it. I have not seen the poetry of it. But it doesn't matter the poetry. It doesn't matter the content. Art is always there to express voice for those that have and also to represent the voice for those that don't. And think of yourself right now as you're about to submit being that voice for those that have and those that don't just through beauty through community and through connection especially while we're physically distancing yeah beautiful beautiful way to wrap up the the interview liab thank you so much for your time and for those who are interested in liab's work i will uh leave a link to urban voices project in the uh, description section of this video. So please feel free to visit his website. And Leah, I can't thank you enough for your time. Thanks so much for, for speaking with us today. Thank you. Thanks, thank Eric. You, thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye, guys.